Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another lesson from God's Word. We're looking at Luke's life of Christ. Today we're in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22 and verse 35. Luke 22 and 35. And he said to them, When I sent you without money, bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, Nothing. Then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. Now, as the Lord draws closer and closer to the cross, he's trying to prepare the hearts and minds of the disciples for the ordeal that they're about to go through. Their faith is going to be sorely tested because this would be a unique uh, situation in history. Never before would they see the Lord taken away from them the way he was about to be. And never again uh, would they have this experience happen. They would suffer tribulation in the world. The Lord had promised them that in John 16. But the coming comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom he would send to them, was going to strengthen them and carry them through these coming trials and tribulations. And yet here, there was going to be a time when things were going to change. He wasn't going to be able to immediately superintend them the way he had been during his earthly ministry. As they were with him, he had taken care of all their needs. Now it's clear by what he says here that when he sent them out before, there was this apostolic commissioning where he sent them out by twos to preach the gospel of the kingdom to Israel. And he told them not to make provision uh, for the future in a sense, go without money, go without knapsack, go without sandals. He says, did you lack anything? They said nothing. So there was this promise of provision as they went forth on the king's business. And Israel being a theocracy, being a nation in covenant with the living God, uh, the Lord, Yahweh or Jehovah as he's called in the Bible, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D in our English translations, the Lord was going to provide for them through his people. And so whatever houses they came into, they were instructed to enter in and not leave them, you know, not try and go find better food or better quarters elsewhere. If someone received them, go in and enjoy their hospitality. And if they receive that message, their peace was to come upon their house. But if they rejected it, of course, it was the opposite experience. In this, they had found out that God could provide for them. Now, so many scriptures tell us of this. God is the God of providence. He's the God who, even among those who are unbelievers, gives them naturally the things of life. He causes his sun to shine on the evil and the good and makes it to rain on the just and the unjust, the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. Psalm 37, which has a lot of verbiage that recurs in the Sermon on the Mount, and it talks about how God will feed his people. A later Psalm 81 says, Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. George Mueller took that as one of his favorite verses. He was the great uh, faith worker, the man who established a work of God, supporting orphans and helping various missionaries around the world, as well as preaching the gospel and teaching the saints. And he did all of this for years, just making his needs known to God in prayer and relying on him to supply those needs. And God indeed did that. So our God is well able to meet our needs, but the Lord's trying to bring home to the disciples here the severity of the case, that they're not going to have the Lord there who is able to take 12 loaves, uh, or sorry, five loaves and two fishes and to multiply it to feed thousands and have left over, you know, 12 baskets full. He's not going to miraculously supply their need such that they have seven baskets full after the feeding of the 4,000. And the Lord is going to be otherwise occupied, we might say. He's going to be busy dying on the cross. As it says here, quoting Isaiah 53, that famous servant song from Isaiah, speaking about the suffering servant, Messiah, whom we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, that which is written must still be accomplished in me. He was numbered with the transgressors. So the Lord Jesus was going to be 
classified by mankind among those who were lawbreakers, among those who had gone over an established standard, an egregious sinner. He would be accused of being a blasphemer and a false prophet and a seditious person. But the Lord was none of those things. The Lord was the obedient son of God who never committed a sin. He never did anything negative in that sense, and he never failed to do the positive. He loved righteousness and hated iniquity. And yet, as the Savior, he would take the place of sinners. He would allow himself to be numbered with the transgressors, even though that was an unjust decree. On the cross, he would be taking the place of sinners and dying under the wrath of God against their sin. It wasn't just that men would consider him a transgressor, but God would treat him on the cross as if he was a transgressor. He knew he wasn't, but God, the judge of all the earth, would lay on him the iniquity of us all, as Isaiah 53 says. And 1 Peter 2 says it similarly. It says he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. So when he was dying on that cross, he was dying for our sins, according to the scriptures. And then he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, because as Peter would explain on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, it was not possible for death to hold him. But the Lord, of course, throughout his ministry was doing things according to God's timetable. He was depending on his father and going according to the chronology that had been set forth before the foundation of the world, that already there in eternity past, he was marked out to be the Lamb of God. He was going to be the coming Redeemer who would provide the right ransom payment, the right payment to free us from our slavery to sin. And he would suffer the guilt and penalty of sin, dying under the wrath of God on the cross. But the Lord would rise again triumphant, having paid for it all. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, Hebrews 1 tells us. So the Lord has done this great work of salvation. And yet at this moment we're reading of in Luke 22, it was still to come. It was hours away. It had not yet been fulfilled, but it was going to be. For he says, the things concerning me have an end. So the Lord was going to fulfill every prophecy regarding his first coming to earth, regarding his passion, his suffering, his death. He was going to fulfill all those things. He was also going to fulfill the resurrection. He was also going to fulfill the ascension back to heaven's glory. And one day, believe me, though it hasn't happened yet, he's going to fulfill what he said. He's going to come again for his church and catch us up to be with him in the air, as 1 Thessalonians 4 says. And he's going to fulfill what Acts 1 says and what Luke 24 says and what Zechariah 12 say, uh, says, uh, all of which say that the Lord is coming back to earth to deliver Israel, to restore that nation to himself and to fulfill the covenants and the promises that he made to them in the Tanakh, what we Gentiles call the Old Testament. Now, the Lord knew the timetable, and he knew things were changing. So he wasn't going to be with them, immediately occupied with their physical needs and the physical circumstances they were in. They were going to be on their own, in a sense. Now, at the same time, John 17, the great prayer the Lord Jesus prays to his Father. We see God the Son speaking with God the Father. So we're privy to a private conversation within the persons of the Trinity. And in John 17, the Lord makes it clear that of them whom of those whom thou hast given me, I have lost none except for the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. So the Lord had not lost any of the disciples and was not going to lose any. He said to the Father, keep them through thy name. They were going to be kept. They were going to be secure. That's what the Lord indicated in the previous story that we read about him telling Peter that he had prayed for him that his faith would not fail. Indeed, not any true child of God, not anyone who's been born again by faith in Christ, not anyone redeemed and saved by the blood of Christ is going to be lost. That is not possible. God is a comprehensive Savior, and the Lord Jesus is faithful and will not let us be lost. And so they weren't going to be lost, but the physical circumstance was going to change. Now was not the time to go out and proclaim the kingdom and expect to be received in houses. Now they were going to be scattered. 
as he prophesied elsewhere in Zechariah and Matthew and Mark tell us he fulfilled it. Smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. So they were going to be scattered. So now they need to take the money bag and they need to take their knapsack. And he says, if you don't have a sword, sell your garment and use it. Now let's be, uh, and buy it rather. Uh, let's be careful what the Lord is not saying here. The Lord is not advocating violence. The Lord is not saying that you're going to build my kingdom by fighting for it. Because that would be a flat contradiction of what the Lord Jesus would later tell Pontius Pilate when he stood before his court. In John 18, he tells us, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered. So he's not saying here that Christians are to take up arms and fight against our enemies or fight that we shouldn't be persecuted. No, uh, we have a right to suffer and we have a right to die. To us, it's been given not only to believe on the Lord Jesus, but to suffer for his sake, Philippians 1 tells us. So it's part of being a Christian that we identify with our Lord. And just as the world persecuted our Lord, so they persecute believers. So they hate us. So they'll even uh, deal with us harshly and maybe even kill us if God permits it. But we have to remember we're secure in the Lord. No, the Lord is here speaking in a dramatic way, I might say metaphorically, to say, listen, times are going to get tough now. This night is going to be hard, and the coming days aren't going to be easy for you. Uh, things are changing, because I'm going to the cross to suffer and die, and you're not going to be in a safe situation at that point, at least from your perspective. Everything around you is going to seem scary and dangerous. So again, coming back to Peter denying the Lord three times. The Lord understands the pressure that is brought on Peter. The Lord understands people laughing at him and speaking against him. It doesn't excuse Peter. It doesn't exonerate him from denying the Lord three times. But on the other hand, the Lord is telling the disciples things are about to get very, very hard. So you need to go out uh, ready for the, the grueling maneuvers. You know, soldiers in the country where I live the United States, are able to join the military reserve. We have the Army Reserve and the Naval Reserve and Air Force Reserve and so forth. And in time of emergency, our government can call up these soldiers. They're not normally uh, working as soldiers in their day-to-day -day life. Now, one weekend a month, the ones I've known at least in the reserves, one weekend a month they go and they do something with their unit, with the Army unit or Naval unit or whatever it is. They go and do some kind of military service. And often it is training. Often it is maneuvers. So this soldier or this sailor or airman or Marine, whatever they are, uh, they may be you know, living a very cushy job. They might be white collar sitting at a desk all day, uh, Monday through Friday. But when the weekend comes that they're going off on maneuvers, they're leaving the house in their fatigues, they're wearing combat boots, they're ready to march, they're ready to do serious calisthenics, they're ready to take a backpack, a big backpack on their back and carry uh, their, their submachine gun or whatever kind of weapon they have. And they're going out and they're preparing. And then I think once a year they do more extensive maneuvers I forget whether it's a week or two weeks, how long it is. It might even vary based on which branch of service or where you are. But again, you go out and you train and you prepare so that in time of war or time of national emergency, you can be called up. Now, in essence, it's like he's telling the disciples, time to put on the fatigues, time to get ready to don the combat backpack, time to get the M16 out of storage and oil it up and make sure it's clean and ready to go. Lock and load, people, because you're moving into a harder situation. You've got to be ready because hard things are going to come your way. A lot's going to be thrown at you. And so he's telling them how difficult it's going to be. And clearly they don't fully understand what the Lord's saying because they haven't yet come to grips with what he's told them, that he's going to be rejected that he's going to die on the cross and that he's going to rise again from the dead. Every time he says that, they're sort of not listening. 
they're distracted, they're rounding that off to their nearest supposition. And obviously by what we've seen earlier in this chapter, they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. So they're not thinking of suffering, they're thinking of glory. They're not thinking of the cross, they're thinking of the crown. And the order, as we've seen, is suffering and then glory. The death of Christ, followed by his resurrection and ascension and his coming again in glory. That's God's order. And they don't yet get it because they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. So they had a few among the twelve there in their supply kit. They had a few swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Now, clearly, he's not trying to outfit them for armed rebellion. He's not, you know, telling a group of zealots, get ready for the battle. Get ready to go out and tangle with the Roman legions or with the, the police force at the behest of the Sanhedrin. Now, they've only got two swords among 12 guys. And the Lord basically is saying, okay, okay, guys, good. Uh, they don't quite get it. They don't get what the Lord's saying, that the times are changing, that the persecution is going to intensify, and that the worst thing imaginable from their vantage point is about to occur, that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to die. And yet our Lord knows full well what time it is, what's going to happen, and what he's going to do on the cross. And he doesn't shrink back from it. He goes to it willingly. And in the next lesson, we'll learn about the Garden of Gethsemane, and we'll see there that our Lord full well knows what he has signed up to do. And he is fulfilling the will of the Father, and he's going to carry it all the way through. He's going to take that cup from his Father's hand and drink that cup of suffering and sorrow to its dregs for us. And so thanks be to God for such a Savior who wasn't surprised or taken aback by what he was being asked to do. This is what was planned and ordained by his Father and him and the Holy Spirit as well, we might add, from eternity past. And this is something that is going to be marveled at for eternity future. We're going to continually look back to what the Lord Jesus did in dying and rising again, and we will marvel at the grace of God. Or as 2 Corinthians 9 puts it, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thank you for listening.